Well, good afternoon, anybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to you uh, and to our uh, Enlight flagship lecture session four, which is on empowering learners. Uh, I think that is quite a central topic for our common endeavor, that is uh, to bring into being a university consortium in Europe uh, between all the partner universities of the Enlight uh, European University. And at the core of this idea of having a European university is, aside from research, also teaching. And we have quite an ambitious vision about how we understand this kind of teaching. And um, part of it is empowering learners in order for them not only to um, practice their skills, uh, their academic skills in various disciplines, but also to become engaged as citizens in the global change um, that uh, we see uh, as necessary and which is at the core of the key uh, challenges uh, that the Enlight uh, Network is going to address. <clears throat> we have a wonderful um, kind of a panel this afternoon to discuss uh, and to learn about empowering learners. And um, um, we have a wonderful keynote uh, that will be given by Irina Bukova in a second. But next to her, I may uh, briefly uh, point to Katrin van Perk and Leif Östman, which will give us then a more extended uh, kind of an introduction into the topic. Um, but we, before we do so, let me perhaps uh, introduce to you uh, Irina Bukova, which is at the external advisory board of our Enlight Consortium. Uh, that external board is quite a prestigious one, and we are very happy altogether that uh, people like Irina, and particularly Irina, uh, joined that board in order to give us advice on how to steer the ship of our common endeavor um, in the Enlight network. Um, Irina Bokova is best known for her time as a director general to the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO in Paris. And indeed, she was acting as a director general between 2009 and 2017. So a rather extended period of time. And of course, all of her experiences from that time um, will uh, give us uh, more insights and more understanding about our topic. And aside from being a diplomat, uh, first in, uh, in the UNESCO and earlier on for her uh, home country, which is Bulgaria, Irina also had a fascinating academic career, should I say, because she first started out as a student to the Moscow State Institute of International Relations then visited the University of Maryland and afterwards has been participating in the very prestigious executive program of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. With all those skills, of course, she has not only played an important role in a very special UN organization, but also has had other um, tasks uh, and other efforts done in the area of international relations, culture, and as part of culture, also education. Irana, Irina, we are very happy that you made it for, uh, for being with us uh, and that you offered to share your ideas about our topic uh, this afternoon. And with this, and without any further ado, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thank you for this uh, very kind uh, presentation. And uh, <clears throat> I say that I'm delighted uh, to be with you here today. And thank you for the invitation also to join the uh, advisory board of the uh, Enlight project. Um, I would like to say that I uh, commend uh, the nine universities uh, for this uh, fascinating ambition, uh, which goes uh, very much into the heart of uh, what the United Nations has set uh, as the agenda for Sustainable Development 2030. 
Uh, and let me say that particularly now when we are in a pandemic situation and we're looking forward for the post-pandemic uh, recovery, I do believe that education becomes even more relevant because we want to build back, but we want to build back better. And if we can't do it without putting a very strong emphasis on education, uh, we know that uh, uh, this uh, has been uh, a crisis with uh, uh, unprecedented consequences, political, economic, uh, social, I would say also ethical. Uh, and uh, recently the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, has mentioned that uh, this uh, pandemic crisis mm -hmm. may bring us back 24 years. We may lose 24 years of development uh, in all the areas, I would say, of um, uh, activity and ambition that the United Nations had. Uh, and uh, uh, when we speak about uh, the sustainable development agenda, of course, um, we should add the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, and um, uh, I, I know that uh, the uh, European Green Deal nowadays, which is based on both of these uh, documents, uh, can't be rich if uh, universities uh, and education system generally is not involved strongly. So um, I would say that uh, uh, I would like to share with you actually three points. My first point uh, is that we need indeed to renew our commitment to sustainable development and Agenda 2030 and to put education at its heart. Uh, while we know that uh, the uh, SDGs uh, already were aspirational and maybe some of the targets ca cannot be or may be out of reach, uh, still uh, I believe these goals remain a critical framework for uh, international cooperation. And the importance of, uh, of this agenda uh, is, uh, if anything, reinforced by the pandemic. Uh, and also, uh, I would say that uh, the crisis has put forward um, uh, a kind of a wake up call for all of humanity, for governments, um, also to put into the forefront the well being of people, the human security, uh, and to invest uh, in people, to invest in uh, economies, in societies uh, that are green, clean, healthy, safe, and of course, more resilient. So this is where the importance of goal number four of the sustainable development agenda, promoting inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong learning for all comes with all its critical importance for the future. Um, I believe we all know, we are all convinced that education plays an important multifaceted role in the new global development agenda. Uh, which strives to eradicate poverty, address social needs, um, as health, uh, achieve gender equality, social protection, job opportunities, uh, uh, of course, uh, aspire for uh, environmental protection uh, and tackle the challenges of climate change. But let me just um, uh, once again remind that it is the first time ever that such a holistic vision of education was adopted from the early childhood until the tertiary education. And this is very much in response to the emerging um, economy with its constant demand for innovation, for training, for reskilling, uh, for lifelong learning, but also the demands of sustainability and resilience. And it is the first time, there are many firsts uh, in the goal number four, of the SDG agenda, uh, but of course, uh, including the tertiary education, higher education was an important endeavor that UNESCO uh, already aimed at uh, by its conference in 2009 on higher education and all through the different uh, partnerships and work that uh, uh, advocacy work that we have been doing with university, with governments, with uh, main stakeholders in order to achieve this in 2015. And I was just uh, the other day uh, at a panel discussion also with Ambassador David Donahue from Ireland, uh, the permanent delegate of Ireland to the United Nations, uh, who was one of the co-conveners uh, of the SDG agenda in those times. And he reminded uh, that it was not indeed uh, so easy, so simple to include it uh, into the agenda because it was, has been overlooked for a very, very long time. 
So if uh, we speak particularly about uh, the SDG for in higher education, I would uh, like to remind uh, some of these elements that are there. Uh, the uh, standards against which higher education uh, uh, was measured uh, were that tertiary education should be equally accessible, affordable, and high quality. This is uh, fourth goal, target number three, that it should promote skills that are relevant for employment, decent work, and entrepreneurship the next target, and more scholarships should be given especially to least developed countries. And last but not least, that well-trained scientists, teachers, and competent graduates working in seminal positions should be also encouraged. They're very much needed in the global south as well as in the global north. So, um, I, I speak about uh, higher education and the, the first time it was uh, included and by all means, uh, uh, if it is there, uh, it is in order to emphasize that universities, the role of universities in education, in science, research, uh, innovation, and to build back better nowadays is immense because the universities have a growing responsibility to translate this global sustainable development agenda to local circumstances. And if I may quote from the recently published guide of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, um, led by uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University, where I'm sitting also on its leadership council, uh, accelerating education for the SDGs in universities, and I quote, universities and other higher education institutions uh, have a critical role in helping societies achieve the SDGs. And one of the most important ways they can contribute to this is to support students and other learners within their sphere to develop the necessary knowledge, skills, and mindsets to contribute to solving the complex sustainable development challenges our world faces. So, uh, it, in a nutshell, we know that uh, higher education and sciences are drivers of, uh, of transformation uh, and in cooperation particularly with um, uh, policymakers, with businesses, uh, societies and large scientific community is tasked indeed with developing visions for more sustainable societies, not just economies, but societies, exploring development pathways and supporting sustainable technological and social innovations. And speaking about how we empower learners, uh, it is important that universities indeed create learning environments to foster skills, both for the achieving of the 17 SDGs and responding to the emerging challenges of the fourth industrial revolution through their teaching, research, uh, pedagogy, but also the other point, uh, the other side, of the coin is educating and creating global citizens, as you just, uh, Peter said it, in a world that is changing and transforming with unprecedented speed. Universities should teach young people critical thinking and curiosity while embracing change. We know all that education nowadays is not about simply passing the knowledge of one generation to the other but about the ability of young people to make choices. And in order to make the right choices, education should equip them with a set of values and ethics. And as Professor Jacques wrote, Sachs wrote also in the preface of the uh, above mentioned guide, sustainable development constitutes an important new intellectual discipline and organizing principle for universities in our time. Without being an academic, um, I would like to say that I do agree with Professor Sachs. So if we just focus on the first part of it, on the skills, there are many studies uh, nowadays um, as to what are the emerging skills or the skills that are on the rise and that are sought after by employers. And these skills are analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, creativity, originality, initiative, technology design, programming, critical thinking and analysis, 
complex problem solving, leadership and social influence. And it's very important that we see this very much on the rise, emotional intelligence, um, reasoning, uh, problem solving and ideation uh, initiatives um, and systems analysis and evaluation. So evidence shows that from strictly economic terms, more and more research shows that students that are capable indeed of uh, some creative insights um, that are more uh, prone to work in the diverse teams uh, that are navigating through cultural uh, differences, they definitely will be in a workplace in an advantage uh, where this meaning of skills um, is different. Uh, it is not a technical only issue, but it is uh, just uh, the ability to work with experts, stakeholders from, and to find the common understanding in the benefits of sustainable development. This is extremely important in my mind because um, what we know um, when we speak about uh, the fourth industrial revolution, when we speak about the fusion of technologies uh, that are blurring the lines uh, between the physical, digital and biological sphere, uh, as uh, the founder of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, uh, uh, has, has put it, uh, there is indeed a growing uh, need, an increasing need for higher education to search for responses. Responses both from their positive economic, social and environmental impact, uh, the sustainability side of it, but as well as the challenges they represent for all of us, for humanity. So I do believe that uh, successful education strategies uh, uh, and effective strategies uh, should include in equal measure the consideration of the human, the way these uh, uh, technologies are shifting uh, economic power, but also how they impact the uh, social economic situation. Uh, and also what are the threats, the challenges within our world that is increasingly interconnected and needs uh, intercultural understanding. So um, uh, uh, my second point about the role of universities uh, actually was indeed uh, about uh, the, uh, this fusion of um, uh, sciences, the importance of uh, uh, breaking the silos uh, between the natural, the social sciences. And uh, uh, from this point of view, I know that it has been very much uh, uh, into the debate, uh, and it will be probably uh, within the Allied project. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going back uh, also to uh, very many of the uh, previous thinkers. Um, let me quote just um, uh, the great uh, French intellectual uh, thinker, thinker of the 20th century who uh, worked very closely with uh, UNESCO at those times. Um, uh, I'm speaking about uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, who influenced the thinking about uh, race, ethnicity, culture, diversity, and science. And um, uh, he influenced also a lot the linkages between the social and natural sciences, a topic uh, uh, which, as I said, is uh, very high uh, on the minds of uh, scientists and academics. Uh, he said, and I quote, recommending the unification of methodological thinking between the exact sciences and the human sciences, uh, the speculations of the earliest geometers and arithmeticians were concerned with men far more than with the physical world. Pythagoras, for one, was interested in anthropological significance of numbers and figures, as were the sages of China, India, pre-colonial Africa and pre-Columbian America, preoccupied with the meaning and specific attributes of numbers. And uh, just to mention, I would say quite a remarkable uh, event that uh, happened in the uh, end of 2017 in October. It was the decision of the members of the International Council for Science, uh, uh, ICSU. I know that uh, many of you probably are involved uh, with its work as well as with the International Social Sciences Council, uh, with both of whom uh, UNESCO worked and I worked very closely, when they took a decision, a final decision, to merge the two organizations to become the International Science Council. I think it was very emblematic for this 
uh, approach, of interdisciplinary approach, and it happened after the adoption of the Agenda 20, uh, 2015. And uh, uh, the strategy nowadays of the new organization uh, emphasizes indeed uh, this importance of uh, problem solving of sustainability uh, and working in a uh, kind of a, a fusion uh, way. My third point that I would like to share with you uh, is uh, about, uh, I think, one of the fundamental questions um, uh, that uh, we ask ourselves today, uh, has the COVID-19 pandemic changed education forever? Of course, I'm speaking about uh, technology, I'm speaking about the rise of the e-learning, uh, whereby teaching already has started uh, remotely, digital platforms, it, it, which existed before, but nowadays uh, uh, it's accelerated in an unprecedented manner. Uh, and uh, uh, it means that uh, uh, the, the changes this uh, coronavirus uh, has inflicted upon us might be here to stay. So from that point of view, I think there is a lot of need still uh, to look at uh, the lessons, the lessons for the future, if we want to still to keep education as a powerful social mobility vehicle that narrows the inequality gaps and is the strongest transformational force in the world. And I'm not developing a lot on this issue, but we all know that the easy learning also in some cases exacerbated inequalities. And we really have to go deeper into the analysis in order to prevent, to mitigate this aspect of the e-learning. Of course, there are many positive things. There are many innovative uh, innovation uh, in education. There are many new public-private partnerships uh, uh, that existed. Uh, there are many uh, new policies to build the resilience um, uh, into the uh, education system. All this is extremely positive. But uh, without uh, looking uh, at the way, indeed, uh, the digital transforms um, uh, education in societies, we will not be able to reach the full potential that uh, it has. Now, um, a very interesting idea, uh, and I know that you have been also discussing it and you will be discussing it. Uh, uh, it is indeed uh, uh, for where universities and how universities uh, uh, and lifelong learning uh, that is also promoted by goal number four of the SDG agenda can um, uh, play this increasing role with more flexibility and openness. It's an interesting uh, uh, global debate uh, how, how to make these systems open. And uh, uh, I know that the World Academy of Arts and uh, uh, Sciences and the World uh, uh, University Consortium recently organized a series of conferences they, that have concluded that rapid expansion of the educational system is feasible, affordable, and absolutely essential to prepare, including on the digital platforms, uh, young people, uh, for uh, the successful adulthood, but it will require major changes in contact, pedagogy, certification, and delivery system. So uh, this is still a debate ongoing, um, uh, how to develop models for, complement, for complementary and alternative delivery systems. Now, um, when I said that uh, education is not just a technical way of transfer transferring knowledge from one generation to another, uh, I uh, meant uh, also the uh, very important uh, target of sustainable development goal, uh, uh, which is uh, target uh, for seven. Uh, and it is indeed um, probably one of the most important. It goes into the heart of education. It is about um, ensuring that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including, among others, through education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity and culture's contribution to sustainable development. Indeed, this is uh, the global citizenship education, uh, which uh, uh, became a new concept uh, launched by UNESCO uh, into the run-up to sustainable development agenda. Uh, and uh, I'm still very grateful to uh, 
the then Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, because he embraced this concept uh, uh, suggested and formulated by uh, UNESCO and included it uh, into his very important uh, uh, global uh, education, global first initiative at those times so that it reaches uh, uh, decision, decision makers. Now, um, in the different domains, uh, uh, this uh, global citizenship education uh, already is evolving. There is a lot of research um, on this, uh, uh, the three areas, which is the cognitive domain, um, knowledge, understanding, critical thinking about the global, the local, the regional, uh, the socio-emotional domain also, which is a sense of belonging to a common humanity, sharing values, responsibilities, empathy, solidarity, and respect for differences and diversities very much needed now in the COVID-19 because unfortunately we are seeing uh, on the rise xenophobia uh, and discrimination and the behavioral domain which seeks to lead students to act effectively and responsibly at local, national and, lo and global levels for a more peaceful and sustainable world. And I think this is one of the uh, ambitions also of the Enlight project. So to end my uh, presentation, let me just uh, say that indeed uh, the role of universities uh, nowadays uh, is, is really critical, uh, not only because we see an explosion of university and higher education in the world uh, probably for the last decade, but because the main function at the end of the day of universities is indeed to make significant contribution to society by fostering knowledge, critical thinking, and broad ca uh, capabilities, of course, and technical skills and young people. And universities uh, are not now nor ever have been solely focused on preparing young people for the workforce. They are, but not solely. But it is also about values and citizenship it is indeed about preparing young people to live in a globalized world. So this, I believe, uh, is uh, an important, one of the most important messages of the uh, Agenda 2030, because universities, um, higher education, should not be strangers um, to this new vision uh, and concept that UNESCO launched uh, uh, about global citizenship education in the 21st century. I deeply believe it goes indeed into the heart of what education stands for, human development, human security, and our peace with nature. So thank you for your attention. Well, uh, thank you very much, Irina, uh, for in a way putting into context the endeavor of the enlightened universities in view of the larger set of priorities, concepts, and challenges at international and, should I say, global level, and to spell out its implications for education, uh, which you have been caring about for so many years, uh, not only during your uh, time at UNESCO, but I'm sure also afterwards. That was certainly much food for thought. And thank you again for uh, your lecture and uh, for being with us today. With your mind, uh, words in mind, we now can turn to an important aspect uh, of the topic, which is something like challenge-based teaching. Um, I think uh, a very uh, relevant issue in this uh, context, if we are uh, aware of what you have uh, just uh, told us. And we are really grateful that two eminent scholars on the topic from within our network we're so kind to give us uh, an overview on this. And uh, also the two in a way are a good best practice for uh, the entire idea about the Enlight project because indeed they uh, are already cooperating since quite a time. Uh, Leif Ustmann is a professor of didactics at Uppsala University and a director of didactic research and the research group SMED, so studies of meaning making in educational discourses. And uh, Karin van Perk is a coordinator at Ghent University for the Center for the Sustainable Development's research line on sustainability education. And she is also in a way affiliated with Uppsala University 
because uh, she is a Marie Sklodowska Curie fellow over there. And uh, to tell you a secret, uh, after our discussion today, she will head for Uppsala uh, in order to, um, uh, to work there as a fellow. Uh, so two enlightened universities in close contact. And before I give the floor to you, Life and Katrin, uh, let me just again highlight that we also have a question and answer period in this session. Um, and uh, that I would invite you uh, to uh, give us any questions or comments that you would have um, by way of the chat in order for us to allow us to organize the Q&A session later on. But with this in mind, I now give the floor to Life and Karin for their presentation. And thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, and uh, it was a wonderful contextualized uh, presentation of Irina showing the importance of what we are going to talk about that is the challenge-based teaching, what, why, and how. And uh, since Katrine is uh, running the, the PowerPoint, I have to now again tell her to switch the PowerPoint. So please, Katrine. So it's important to stress that um, before we start our presentation, that there are some very, very interesting didactical innovation already taking part in the universities of Enlight. And especially I want to point to these so-called living labs in, in different places, but also you can find them in other uh, European universities. In central documents in Enlight, um, we can also find that uh, the, um, we can find some very, very important discriminations and also definitions what is supposed to, what are we supposed to think about when we talk about challenge-based higher education. Uh, I think it's very important to say that they, this, there are certain content areas that are in focus. It's health and well-being, it's climate change, equity, circular energy, and the digital revolution. But there are also other determinations of challenge-based education that is connected to the so-called T-shaped profession. Can you please change? Another one, please. And here you can find two different types of competences. One that you could call the deep knowledge, which contains uh, areas, for example, of domain theory, technical content, problem solving, and so on. And the second type of uh, competences that is here called the generic 21st century skills, and here you find the, the, some of the more generic uh, uh, skills that uh, Irina was also talking about. We have here the critical thinking, innovation, creativity, cross-disciplinary competences, and so on. Together, all these sort of um, uh, competences are supposed to deliver some outcomes, some very crucial outcomes. Is supposed to empower learners to address complex societal challenges and promote quality of life and sustainability in our cities and communities and beyond. Yes, we are supposed to foster the learners and our students to be agents of change, and we are supposed to make them to be able to tackle the challenges of tomorrow and probably of today too. We can take the next step. This is a very challenging ambition, of course, and it's very inspiring. And there are many, many important pedagogical potentials in this approach. But there are also some possible pitfalls and obstacles, and there are some concerns that are raised, of course. One of them are there are no time, no space for getting all of these sort of competences into our teaching. And it's very, very difficult because we have a monodisciplinary organization and how can we bring in transdisciplinarity in a such system? And how to do when addressing the complexity of sustainability issues, it's so many different aspects and perspectives that can be taken. And how should we think about all these sort of approaches and pedagogical approaches that's called problem solving, project-based, active learning, collaborative. These are concerns that we have been working with in didactical research, for quite a long time. There are some very important uh, um, 
some important um, uh, knowledge has been brought out and, and uh, produced. And it's also very important to see that uh, th this sort of didactical knowledge that has been produced needs to also be brought into connection with the teacher, teacher's professional competences, but also with the competences of the and, and expertise of the different disciplines. So in many ways, we are, we are looking for and really emphasizes the importance when you do didactical developmental work and, and also research to, to find a co-creating uh, atmosphere, a co-creating conditions, because we need both the competences from didactical research, but also the expertise and experience of university teachers and researchers in order to to tackle all these concerns and, and pitfalls and so on. Before we continue, I will just say what, what is coming in remind us of this lecture. Uh, we will look in for how to, how to use, how to create time and space for educating the teaching professionals. We also look into how to create fruitful settings for addressing complex sustainability challenges. And lastly, we will touch upon how to use the authentic problem as unique pedagogical opportunities and learning opportunities for the students. Let's start with the first uh, uh, concern, which connects to many of these different uh, uh, problems that we or, or gaps or concerns that we started with. Are these competences compatible? That is a very interesting question is deep knowledge and the generic skills, are they compatible? Can we, through challenge-based education, really realize this ambition to bring them together? And as you said, how can we create time and space for teaching deep knowledge and generic skills in the same time? Okay, let's see what we can learn from didactical research. I would like here to start with the uh, with, uh, different types of learning strategies that one can find. One strategy is that we all know about and that some of the students unfortunately use is the strategy of learning through memorization. And memorization do not involve understanding. And that is very important to, to emphasize because what we are very much looking for through university education is to create deep understanding, deep knowledge. And of course, there are different depths of understanding, there are dif different, different, different depths of deep knowledge. And here you can find, we want to emphasize three different uh, depths or the three different qualities of learning. One is when you sort of just focus on learning disciplinary knowledge and what we call induction into science. And of course, this is a very important part of, of, uh, of the quality of learning. But you can also add other uh, activities, namely that the students also are, uh, are getting an opportunity to try to use their disciplinary understanding in order to solve a new disciplinary problem. And here, what we often what we often can see is that when when students are have to apply the knowledge in a new disciplinary problem, they also get an extra deep understanding of the disciplinary questions, models, theories, and so on but also it's an extra learning coming into it because they learn to apply. We know today that most people don't, nest, don't automatically go from disciplinary knowledge in order to be able to solve a new problem in the, in the disciplinary context. So that is often something that needs to be trained. Some people do it automatically, but many don't. The next level, and this is much more uh, problematic or more difficult for the students is to trained to use the, the disciplinary knowledge in order to solve a real world problem. And this type of teaching we call learning from science. Here, of course, you get again an extra depth in the, in, the, in the understanding of the disciplinary models and theories and so on. But you also learn to apply the, the knowledge and the understanding into real world problems, into everyday problems. And this is some, something that is very difficult to, to achieve and needs often a lot of training. But of course, it's also generating this generic competencies that we talked about, creativity, innovative thinking, cross-disciplinary thinking, and so on. 
let me just illustrate the problem or the way of thinking about this different depth of knowledge. Uh, we'll take a very, very simple um, question, a simple uh, question on a chemistry test, a national test in Sweden a couple of years ago. And uh, the, 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 the question sounds like this. Lisa is going to the shop and has bought a packet of salt and put it on the bike. On the way home, the packet fall off the bike and all salt got, gets mixed with the gravel, with the stones, with the sand. And the question to the student is, what should Lisa do in this situation? I think if you just use five seconds to reflect that you can guess what most students will answer. Exactly. They will answer, go back to the shop and buy a new packet of salt. We know by research that many of the students that answered this like this, in a similar way, they did have the disciplinary knowledge. They did have the disciplinary understanding that was necessary in order to answer this question. But this shows that they were not able to apply this into a totally new context that is an everyday context, which is very, very different of a disciplinary problem. And this also shows that the, the understanding and that they have developed is very context dependent. It's sort of, they can only use it in the, con in the same context which they learned this disciplinary knowledge. They don't have the skill to apply it. So what, did, uh, what, did, what sort of answer did we expect and hope for? Yeah, the, hope, the, the answer would be like a bit like this. Lisa would gather salt and gravel in the bucket. She would add water stir it in order to dissolve the salt in the water. And since then we'll get a solution of salt water and there you find a lot of sand and, and stones and that you can filter by using an ordinary coffee filter and we, you get a pure solution of salt. And if you let the water evaporate from that, then you get back pure salt. <clears throat> and the students who were able to, to, um, to, to answer like this, what they have achieved is a very deep knowledge, both about the, the, the disciplinary understanding, but also how to apply it in a totally new situation that is an everyday problem. Can take the next step. So what we can sort of, if you summarize a little bit what this sort of example shows is that learning through memorization where no understanding will be involved is very often dysfunctional. There are situations that we want people to memorize, but most of the time, we don't want that to happen. We don't, we don't want them to stop there. The other one is that you can make people to learn deep knowledge by have to teach according to induction into science. And you can get even more deeper understanding if you also let the students and train on solving new disciplinary problems through using their disciplinary understanding. And here you get an extra depth and also and learn an extra learning of how to apply your knowledge into new problems. And the deepest type of knowledge, deep knowledge is when the students are, are offered the possibility and trained on solving a real world problem using their disciplinary knowledge through offering them learning from science teaching. Here you get an extra depth, you learn to apply and you have also learned the generical competencies creativity, innovative thinking, and so on. We take the next. So if we summarize this, you could, you have to agree that challenge-based education and higher education, it takes a bit more time and space, but the gains are very, very high. You could say that you, you hit four flies in one hit. You avoid that the students will use the memorization strategy because if you ask them to apply their, their understanding, they will not be able to use memorization as a, as a tool. They are forced into learning the disciplinary knowledge and they will get deeper disciplinary knowledge and they will get also more applying skills if you do use challenge-based higher education. And again, here generic skills comes in. You can also train them in creativity, innovative thinking, cross-disciplinary thinking and so on. And not least important, they will also get insight into the real world problem they are 
handling and, and trying to solve. So I'll leave this floor to you, Katrine. Thank you. And I will uh, continue to build on what you just said by uh, moving on to the, to the second topic, which is uh, how to create fruitful learning settings for addressing the complexity of these uh, real world sustainability challenges. And in line with the things that have just been said by Lev, we often indeed see many teachers uh, struggling with the balance between on the one hand, paying attention to disciplinary specialty, and on the other hand, a cross-disciplinary understanding of, uh, of the issues at stake. This week we had a focus group where this was also a very um, yeah, important concern for many teachers. And questions arising then are, for instance, like, uh, do we need a very specific context to make this possible? Is this something that can only be done in special occasions like a, a specific summer school, for instance, or do we need a total reorganization of the educational system, which is currently maybe not the best fit for it? Uh, or on the other hand, is it also something that uh, we can also do in our ordinary teaching context, in an ordinary uh, course. Another type of questions that we often get uh, from teachers is um, that teachers yeah, realize that, that addressing these complex sustainability challenges um, requires skills like critical thinking and perspective uh, shifting and how to design our teaching in such a way that uh, the students also achieve that sort of uh, skills. And in order uh, to go into this, I will give an, a specific example of uh, a co-creation process, like uh, Lev mentioned, a co-creation of um, a project-based engineering course where uh, university teachers in engineering collaborated with uh, didactic researchers to, to redesign a course. And this happened within the program of electromechanical engineering at uh, Ghent University in the context uh, of an education innovation uh, project that started about five years ago. And the project had actually uh, two important goals. On the one hand, uh, finding out how we could implement sustainability more strongly in the curriculum uh, of that uh, program, the five years curriculum of electromechanical engineering. And on the other hand, redesigning one specific course, a project-based course in the third bachelor year, um, as a sort of uh, important pillar within this uh, curriculum in which sustainability gets an important place. And while working with the teachers, it became very obvious that they had two main purposes, two specific purposes that I found very important. And the first one was, that they really wanted to widen their students' perspective on sustainability and the sense of actually taking them beyond um, yeah, a focus on only uh, energy efficiency. And on the other hand, uh, there was a remaining concern for uh, making sure that the students would be able to develop um, high quality argumentations in relation to these uh, complex and as they have called it also that wicked sustainability problems. So we started uh, to collaborate uh, with this group of teachers and um, with respect to the first uh, purpose, widening the students perspective on sustainability, we worked on uh, these two levels. On the one hand, the curriculum, and on the other hand, this, uh, this one uh, important course in the middle of the curriculum. And what we did was first uh, screening the curriculum with the lens of the sustainable development uh, goals. And as you see on this picture, we, we looked at all the 17 sustainable development goals and searched for interesting and relevant connections to, uh, to their curriculum in order to integrate aspects of sustainability that were currently not yet addressed. And we found some uh, interesting and uh, inspiring connections, for instance, one would not easily relate uh, the, the goal, the SDG on ending hunger to electromechanical engineering, but then it turned out that they had a course on combustion engines where there was um, teaching content on biofuels. And then they, it was relevant to, to integrate something about the conflict between using land uh, for food production or for energy production, which indeed uh, immediately also 
integrate some ethical aspects uh, of sustainability into the curriculum, as uh, Irina Bokova just talked about. At the level of the course, this um, project-based course, uh, there it was uh, an important part of the course is that the students uh, create a specific technical design. And all these technical assignments uh, had a focus on sustainability. As you see on the picture in the middle, some groups constructed uh, a wind turbine on scale, uh, but, uh, and, and others were um, constructing things like uh, solar water heaters, etc. Uh, but all the technical developments had an important sustainability component. But as I said, they also wanted to integrate a broader perspective of uh, sustainability uh, beyond the disciplinary specialty of, of technical issues. And there we, found some inspiration in the work of uh, two of my colleagues, Thomas Bloch and Erik Paredes, and the who are teaching and political science education, and who use the multi-level perspective on sustainability transitions to let students make analysis of the wider uh, societal, or as we call it, socio-technical systems in which technologies are embedded. So we took inspiration from that and adapted a bit uh, the assignment for the political science students into this engineering context. Um, and there was al there's also a guest lecture now of uh, Eric Paradis in the engineering program. So what the students do there is to add this cross-disciplinary uh, perspective uh, to, the, to the disciplinary specialty of uh, the technical design. Then when it comes to the second challenge of the uh, teachers, this um, yeah, concern for letting or allowing the students or yeah, enabling them to develop high quality argumentation was uh, something that really uh, remained. And that also has to do with the generic uh, 21st century skills and the T-shaped professional. Because on the one hand, it has to do with communication skills, for instance, it's about rhetorical skills. But as the teachers very much emphasized, it's probably even more about uh, being able to think critically, uh, being able to connect insights from different disciplines and, and have a wider perspective on the roles of uh, technology, but also of engineers uh, in the transition to a more sustainable society. So they were very much looking for ways to prepare the students to become better in that and also struggling with the question how to evaluate it, because this is very different from uh, assessing exams where students make mathematical calculations. And then we did uh, some didactic research and an empirical uh, analysis. We found that the students were actually very well able to develop high quality argumentation when it came to technical issues. But um, when they were discussing non-technical issues, this was um, yeah, much less the case, which of course has to do with uh, a strong focus on disciplinary knowledge uh, in the curriculum. And this is of course uh, a challenging observation because uh, it's not so easy to, to solve this and it's a difficult, difficult uh, balancing act to add this cross-disciplinary perspective, but uh, to also continue to pay attention to uh, strong disciplinary knowledge, because after all, these students are the people that will, in a couple of years' time, take important decisions, for instance, about how to attach the blades to a wind turbine. So what we decided to do was to bring together uh, didactical expertise with uh, yeah, disciplinary expertise in engineering and practical teaching uh, experience by bringing together didactic researchers and the teachers of this course in a lesson design workshop. And in this workshop, we presented the results of the argumentation analysis for which we used a method that has been developed by Karin Rutzberg and colleagues. Um, and this, this method, which, which is actually an analytical model, we translated it into a didactical model on the quality of argumentation. It's based on the work of Stefan Toulmin. And we worked uh, with this model. And since um, the teachers were so interested in finding ways to assess that, uh, we developed it into an assessment rubric for uh, evaluating the quality of students' argumentation. 
So we developed this uh, rubric, but we did it um, with a so-called open-ended design. And there we have been inspired by uh, Francesco Stuzzi at Ghent University, who did a PhD on open-ended design. And it means actually that we developed a rubric that was deliberately unfinished because it, it remains uh, open um, to be adapted according to the specific context or goals uh, of the users. And we developed two versions of the rubric, one uh, more simple one uh, for um, assessing oral presentations and a more elaborate one to assess uh, written student work. And the next step was then to discuss this uh, with, the, with the engineering teachers and to tailor the assessment rubric to their specific course goals. So we integrated aspects like the wider view on sustainability, the technical and non-technical aspects, uh, etc. And then we ended up with a, with a tailored rubric that you see there um, below. And in this process also, of course, it, um, what happened as well was that the, the, the goals of the course were uh, formulated more sharply and more explicitly. So this was really uh, an interesting exercise to do. And as a next step, um, we started from the assessment rubric and, and more specifically, like we looked at, okay, uh, the high level of uh, performance that we want the students to reach when it comes to developing high quality argumentation, if we want them to really achieve this, how should we revise the course, the assignment, the, the education program in order to allow them to be able to do so. So what we did then was, for instance, revising the assignment that the students got by giving them extra reading materials, formulating some questions a bit more sharply, um, asking uh, yeah, the guest lecturers to, to emphasize specific aspects more strongly, et cetera. And we also formulate recommendations for the program committee in order to um, revise the, or to, to yeah, take, the lessons learned from this with them in, in the revision of, of the whole curriculum so that the students uh, get some building blocks earlier on that they might need to develop these sort of argumentations on the non-technical aspects uh, in this course. So to summarize, challenge-based education, is it only something for special occasions or after a revolution in higher education? I don't think so. Uh, we think that it's a matter of balancing, on the one hand, the deep disciplinary knowledge and insights, which are of vital importance, but to balance it uh, with also paying attention to cross-disciplinary uh, approaches. So it's sort of balancing the horizontal and vertical part of the T-shaped prof professional. Then shortly, uh, the third topic that we wanted to address, uh, how to use authentic problems uh, and how to also make use of the unique pedagogical opportunities uh, involved in them. Um, this is also something that uh, shows up in uh, discussions with teachers that a lot of questions arise when we start to think about how to transform or how to turn societal problems that are often massive, overwhelming a bit, how to turn them into teaching content and how to design activities that take students along in, in a genuine problem solving process when they engage with that sort of uh, problems. How can we uh, plan and perform lessons and assignments that allow students to do that? And also, how can we collaborate with actors outside the university and how to deal with interests that might be a bit differently or very different uh, and that might sometimes be conflicting. And this is, these are challenges that may also arise within the context of Enlight because um, when we look at these five flagship areas, uh, there have been discussions already among people involved in, in research on this and they have put forward several real world problems that students within the Enlight universities might address. For instance, how to make sure that uh, by 2030, we can create 100 carbon neutral cities. What does that take? Or how to increase urban health in African cities? How to promote equity, inclusion and diversity at uni European universities? Or how to make the university campuses more sustainable? Or how to guarantee an equal treatment from birth to death of patients with a migrant background when they arrive at university hospitals. These are some examples of challenges that have already um, 
been listed in relation to the five flagship areas. And as you can see, these are um, quite massive, uh, far reaching and sometimes a bit overwhelming problems to, to present uh, to students. And currently we're also working uh, with teachers and schools uh, who are working with challenge-based education. And we have developed some didactical tools to help uh, teachers to turn that sort of massive societal problems into educational problems. Uh, and one thing that we often emphasize is the didactical work that needs to be done to do this translation exercise, which we call didactical carving. And we don't have time to go into details, but we have, for instance, developed uh, two scales uh, that can help the teachers in this uh, work of didactical carving so as to transform these um, big societal problems into problems that are on the one hand manageable for the students and reach for them, uh, but on the other hand also still remain an authentic challenge that is uh, interesting uh, as a starting point for uh, genuinely challenge-based uh, education. And then another aspect is um, yeah, a model to, to support teachers in uh, designing uh, lessons and assignments and, and select also teaching content in order to plan the lessons in a way that it takes students along in the four phases of a problem solving cycle. Exploring the problem, coming up with potential solutions, implementing solution proposals actually in practice, and then also evaluating the process of problem solving. Going through this whole cycle is very important in challenge-based education. And yeah, we have developed some assignments and some, some uh, have worked with uh, teachers on how to do that. And if we take students along in such a process, they will um, acquire yeah, very, a, a big variety of knowledge and skills. Not only knowledge on what is the problem and what are the consequences, but it also makes it possible uh, to explore whether these consequences might be very different for, or unequally uh, spread uh, for different persons. But also, uh, for instance, not only what are possible solutions, but also are there maybe divergent views on which uh, solutions are desirable. If we, if we talk about building back better, this better might be differently interpreted by, by several people. So this is also very important for the students to learn how to deal with that. Uh, also, when we will come up with possible solutions and implement them, we will learn a lot about what are actually strategies for creating change in society, etc. So this, these are two examples of um, didactical tools that have been uh, developed for supporting teachers and problem-based uh, education. So if we summarize this, uh, we could say that uh, turning real-world problems into interesting teaching content and activities is not something that happens automatically, but that something that requires specific didactical work. And this brings us back to what Leif emphasized in the beginning of the presentation, that that sort of work uh, we think can be done in an interesting way by bringing together didactic researchers with teachers to, to do it in a co-creative setting. And this is happening currently in a number of ongoing projects in which we are involved. But we are also sure that the uh, new and light uh, network and the whole configuration, the focus on these flagship areas and on challenge-based uh, education will create a lot of interesting opportunities for that in the future as well. So, Thank you very much uh, for attending the lecture and we are looking forward to the question and answer session. Well, uh, Katrin and Leif, uh, thank you so much to lining out the details of challenge-based learning for us. Uh, I think with your explanation, you touched upon many issues, which I'm sure many of us have in their minds intuitively um, but the benefit of your lecture, in my view, was to, to bring it to terms, to show us the concepts behind it, and to explain to us um, that it is uh, quite a lot of work, uh, but that it can be done. And that it can be done without uh, either exceeding expectations or needing lots of new money, new institutions or something like this. And I found that fascinating. 
that it really uh, requires hard work, a lot of reflection, uh, but that, with that in, in mind, uh, you really showed us an avenue to a more appropriate uh, kind of teaching, which is more reflecting on what the challenges are there. And uh, so I'm thankful very much to that. Um, and I got, of course, already a number of questions for you. Um, and uh, Due to your excellent time management, we have uh, some minutes still for questions and answers, and the questions vary very much. So, live, um, you got a number of questions regarding how exactly you would really uh, have the gravel, salt, and water mixture handled in order to get the salt out again. And I think uh, we should not perhaps uh, go into much detail for that uh, because unfortunately uh, our time is limited. Um, but I think uh, there are many other interesting answers. Um, um, some people believe that it is very important uh, uh, what you explained to us to do it in the context of uh, the Enlight uh, Universities Consortium. And that would be my question to you in drawing from what is in on the chat to ask you where would you see the surplus benefit of European Union uh, Union universities joining in doing uh, in doing something together on uh, challenge-based uh, teaching? You can also first take the train if you want. Yes. Yeah, I think one of I think there are a lot of uh, possible benefits. I think uh, one of the possibilities is to to use this network to set up these um, yeah contexts of co-creation because I think in all these universities there are didactic researchers with complementary expertise and complementary approaches, and also in all these universities there are teachers doing interesting things. So to set up a context where we can collaborate, for instance, on lesson design workshops or other, um, yeah, in other um, settings, that could be one uh, interesting thing. Another important thing, I think, is also uh, to use the network uh, to overcome another important challenge uh, in education, and that is uh, to inspire each other, to start to share things and to avoid that we continue to reinvent the wheel in all these different home offices uh, yeah, over and over again. So I think, uh, and especially in, in university education, which is quite specialized, uh, there's one uh, electromechanical engineering education program in Ghent, but there might be others elsewhere. So it could be interesting to bring uh, teachers also together that address uh, similar topics or have are facing similar challenges to also learn from each other in a sort of peer-to-peer -peer setting also. And I will connect what Katrin said that it's also very important to do this in, an, in the idea of use, you know, what we do use in, in, in ordinary research is that we, while, while we build on each other, we can also refine each other's work. We can stand on each other's shoulders and make it possible to have an accumulation process over time, because we don't just want to come up with best practices. That is, in one way, not enough, because then when you've done it, no one will refine it, and you don't get the machine going. We have that sort of processes in research. We publish things, we develop things, and we refer to each other, and we have a lot, a lot of processes that we can learn from when, we do, when it comes to science, and these ones we also have to bring into to, uh, to educational context. Because think how much money and time is spent by people inventing the same wheel, reinventing the wheel all the time around the world. We have to break this in order to earn money, save time, and at the same time get higher quality of our education. So even if we can work together, we need to also find systems how to make this to, to grow in the future. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Life. Um, I got a number of uh, additional questions, basically asking you for kind of an empirical validation of what you do. And I think we can point people to your publications and your website uh, to, to see much more good stuff on this. And I'm sure that uh, you are working basically also empirically, not only developing, but also working empirically. 
I now look to Irina, and I don't know if she is still with us, uh, but there is, Irina, there is one yes, last ready. question that I can draw from the discussion, and sorry to just hopping into you uh, on such a short note. Uh, we have now seen that uh, collaboration between European, European universities could be good, because then you could look look at each other and you would be prevented from inventing the wheel a second time, something like this. And Irina, the question to you would be, if there is something like a, a value in international intercultural exchange as such, and if you would look into, because uh, you are uh, a UN person, if you would look into Article 55 of the Charter of the United Nations, you would find that this was built to bring about cooperation in various regards, economic, social, health, and other matters. But then there is the last sentence, which has been the basis for UNESCO, is basically saying international exchanges as, and there's no other objective to it. So it, in a way, it uh, sounds like, uh, that international ex ex exchange could be a benefit in itself. So could you say something on this to close our panels and give us an additional layer of justification of European university col uh, collaboration beyond the level of saying we, are, we have a larger team together or something like this, if you would like to, Irina? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. It's an excellent question, uh, and it uh, resonates deeply uh, with my experience uh, uh, eight years as Director General of UNESCO, because uh, UNESCO exactly was uh, created uh, 75 years ago, now 76th year, to promote uh, international cooperation in education, culture, and sciences. And uh, uh, I believe the, uh, uh, this is the, the backbone of, uh, of multilateralism of international cooperation. Uh, we are seeing, because we're speaking about uh, pandemic nowadays, we see how much interdependent we are and how much also we need these networks of education. I think we do not need to establish new institutions. We just have to be based on them and create these networks uh, where we can have uh, exchange of best experiences, uh, peer review. And the example of UNESCO, if I may, uh, the network of UNESCO chairs in different universities, uh, which are linked to the different aspects of, uh, of water, uh, of uh, biodiversity, the big biodiversity network, uh, which covers uh, under the protection of UNESCO, which covers uh, the uh, um, bigger uh, territory as uh, the Indian subcontinent, just to give one example. Uh, and uh, I do believe that uh, nowadays we really need this uh, open education on one side, of course, uh, to implement uh, all the 17 development goals, because education is a goal in itself, but it is also the basis for all the other uh, sustainable attainment of all the other sustainable development goals. And we should not forget also, it's about peace. It's about building peace in the minds of women and men as the uh, UNESCO constitution. And I would just end with the another line from UNESCO constitution, which probably is my favorite one, is that economic and financial considerations only cannot bring about peace. It's about intellectual and moral solidarity of humanity that we need. And I think this is also where academics, you, universities, and others in bigger networks can contribute both to peace, but also to sustainable development. Thank you very much, uh, Irina, for, for these remarks, which were exactly as I thought. Um, and I think that is a wonderful uh, line set between the salt and the water and the gravel problem, then this innovative uh, kind of thinking about teaching and challenges, and then the ultimate uh, aim, which is peace. And that comes very close to the European integration idea that is the overarching uh, idea which uh, brings all together our endeavors, especially here in the Enlight uh, Universities Network. And I think that is a very, very good uh, note to close 
this wonderful session, which I think has uh, introduced us to a core key area of our Enlight network. And uh, I couldn't really uh, make it possible that all the questions be answered from the chat, but I think that uh, there will be other opportunities to address them. And with this, I wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Irina. Thank you, Katrin and Leif, uh, for sharing your thoughts with us. And now then we'll switch over to the final session of this Enlight starting week. Uh, exercises. Thank you very much and have a good uh, afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.